Here we go. Good afternoon. I'm Trudy Murata. I'm a volunteer with AARP here in Northern Virginia. If you could all please mute your microphones, that would be great. And our program today is a shared program. Lifetime Learning of Northern Virginia has agreed to share some of the programs in their curriculum with us, with our AARP members. So we're delighted to have that partnership. From our earliest beginnings, AARP has championed lifetime, lifelong learning. And that's why AARP is thrilled to be collaborating with the Lifetime Learning Institute of Northern Virginia to bring our members a sampling of the rich programs offered by them each semester. For more than 60 years, AARP has been a wise friend and a fierce defender, helping individuals to ensure that their money, health, and happiness live as long as they do. And AARP has earned this reputation as a wise friend and fierce defender through trusted information, tools, and advocacy designed to protect the health and financial security of older Americans and empower them to choose how they live as they age. And by promising to act as this friend and defender, AARP is helping people who are 50 plus and their families feel confident, in control, and secure as they age with programs such as protecting yourself and your loved ones from fraud and scams through our Fraud Watch Network, get healthy and stay healthy, care for loved ones, make connections, plan a trip, learn new technologies, attend a class and have fun. Like what we are doing here today with the Lifetime Learning Institute of Northern Virginia. So I hope you'll continue to take advantage of these opportunities and more. And now let me turn it over to Derek to talk more about the Lifetime Learning Institute of Northern Virginia. Derek, go ahead. Thank you, Trudy. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I'm just delighted. Let's see, we have almost 230 people already uh, online. And uh, I also am a Northern Virginia volunteer. Uh, specifically, I'm in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, I am the most uh, recent past president. I've been the president the last three years. And um, I wanted to just kind of direct uh, my remarks here. We are obviously interested in any AARP member who is willing or interested in joining LLI. So that's the information I'm uh, I'm I'm going to impart. And I saw that there were there were local people. There were people from Arlington and Vienna. So I guess I'm specifically talking to you, but I don't want to. Uh, eliminate some of the people from across the country because a lot of our programs and offerings are available through Zoom. So having said that, uh, I describe it, LLI Nova membership as being the best deal in town. Our annual membership is $125 and is almost all inclusive. Um, LLI Nova was founded in 1996 uh, with, the, uh, with the purpose of providing uh, services to individuals 55 years of age and older. Uh, the primary benefits of uh, LLI membership uh, involve continuing education, socialization, and travel. Uh, and our primary service area is Northern Virginia. We're based in Annandale, Virginia, in Fairfax. But as I said, we serve uh, people throughout the country with our Zoom programs. Uh, we're affiliated with the Northern Virginia Community College. Uh, we have an office there, and uh, we do a number of collaborative efforts with them, including assisting their scholarship program. Uh, and specifically, some of the programs and services that we offer are primarily classes. Uh, over a calendar year, we will offer 130 different classes in three semesters. We're in a slightly the slightly abbreviated summer session right now but over the fall winter and summer 130 different classes many of them are one-off classes will be a one 90-minute session but uh we do have some extended classes i see uh chuck hulick is on this call he's our facilitator for our great decisions class which is a wonderful eight session class in which we solve all of the uh, the geopolitical problems of the planet uh, over eight weeks, and uh, uh, Chuck facilitates uh, that program. So besides the classes, we also have several special interest groups. We call them SIGs, S-I-Gs, and they're very much like clubs. So we have a photography SIG, 
uh, a bridge SIG, a book club SIG. Uh, we're developing a tech SIG. We have a bridge SIG, a mystery book SIG, a foodies and friends where we get together around the Beltway area once a month to have lunch. Uh, and these are all, uh, you're entitled to join uh, all of these or participate in all of these with your membership. We also provide a number of cultural excursions each year. These can be day trips to places of interest. Uh, recently, we've been to places like Sky Meadow State Park. We've been to Gary Melcher's home gallery in Stafford, Virginia. We've had a Renaissance tea, We've gone to the Marine Corps Museum and a number of other places. We'll generally have three or four of these scheduled uh, over a semester. We also have visual and performing arts programs. Uh, recently, we've been offering most of these at the cultural center or at the uh, uh, at the stage at the George Mason University. And these are particularly of interest because due to one of our members, uh, Anna Dixon, she has gotten us deeply, deeply discounted tickets. Uh, there can be discounts of uh, 90 percent in some cases on tickets, to different operas, musical medleys, uh, ballets and so forth. Um, and uh, finally, the uh, travel aspect. Oh, I should mention forums once a month, nine months a year, nine months a year, every month. But July, August, and December, we have a forum where we will have a, a high-level speaker, be a local uh, author, uh, an attorney on a particular legal issue, uh, uh, a craftsperson of note, and. Uh, uh, these are every Wednesday of the month, except the months that I, I mentioned. Um, then in addition to that, we have uh, a winter party every year, the first Wednesday in December, uh, which is the primary event where all LI members can get together. Uh, wonderful uh, entertainment, uh, decorations, and a great time had by all. Um, most LLI classes are offered on the Annandale campus, most of our live classes, but as I said, we have a number of Zoom classes. Uh, we do have some extension sites, and uh, I would just welcome any AARP member to uh, uh, who might be interested. You can look for more information on our website at llinova.org, or you can. I'll, I will give my email address uh, if you're interested in more information, you can contact me directly. It's my first and last name together, D-E-R-I-C-K-M-A-L-I-S at gmail.com. And I'd be glad to let you know, uh, uh, try to answer any questions you might have about LLI. And in short, we would welcome AARP members to LLI. And with that, Trudy, I'm going to turn the uh, program over to Debbie to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Derek. Um, I'm Debbie Cohn. I'm an LLI board member and I'm the AARP liaison for these classes. And I'm very excited to introduce Mary Ellen O'Toole for what promises to be a very interesting program. As you can see on the screen, she's a retired FBI agent and profiler who has spent nearly half of her 28 year career working on some of the most violent crime cases in the US, serial sexual killers. As director and full-time professor in the Forensic Science Program at George Mason University, she provides training in critical thinking in the assess and the assessment of violent crime scene behavior. So as uh, Trudy said, uh, please put your questions in the chat box during the presentation. And after Mary Ellen is finished, we will unmute everyone and she will answer questions from the chat box and live questions. Um, thank you for coming today, and Mary Ellen, take it away. Thank you, Debbie. Um, what a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to this very esteemed group, and um, I hope once uh, we finish today, you'll know a little bit more about serial killers. Not that that's the most important topic um, in the world, but it's certainly one over the years that I think people find very fascinating. So I'm going to take you deep into the mindset of serial killers based on my experience with these individuals and talk to you about really, really what does make someone like this tick. So I know all of us have seen movies and we've particularly movies that may involve 
um, a serial killer. So does Hollywood get it right? Or is it really just a myth? And are these individuals that could actually be um, our next door neighbor? I know that some of you and family members have watched the TV program, Criminal Minds, but very few people have actually uh, really met an FBI profiler. And so I wanna just tell you a little bit about that because that's where I've spent uh, most of my experience. I am an FBI agent by training. I went through the FBI Academy at Quantico and um, worked in three FBI field offices before I had enough experience to come into the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit, which is a specialized unit back at Quantico, Virginia, where we study criminal behavior 24 hours a day, practically seven days a week. There are very few people trained in the behavioral analysis unit, and yet we cover cases from all over the world. And most of the cases that we work um, can be very old cases, cold cases, um, and cases that have just really hit a brick wall um, with different law enforcement agencies, and they're not sure what they want to do next or can do next. And oftentimes when I was in the BAU, um, I specialized in, in serial murder cases. And that meant that those were primarily, especially serial sexual cases, those were primarily the cases um, that, I, um, that I worked, that I investigated. And then um, I did have the opportunity over my 28 year career as an FBI agent, I did interview a number of serial sexual killers all over the world. And I'll tell you a little bit um, about what it's like to sit down with a serial sexual killer and have a cup of coffee um, with them. So are they a Hollywood creation or are they more likely the man next door? And I will tell you they're much more likely the man next door. And I use the male gender because contrary to what you've heard, the vast majority of serial sexual killers are men. When I started in law enforcement in the mid 1970s, I thought we would see a trend changing and that maybe more women would become these human predators, which is what a serial sexual killer is. But that is not that is not uh, proven to be true. We have maybe one or two serial sexual killers who are female, but the vast majority um, are male. So what is a serial killer? It's someone who hunts human beings, like a hunter will hunt a deer or another animal. This is someone who hunts human beings and kills two or more people over a period of days, weeks, months, or years. And they are contrasted with a mass shooter. They're very different in terms of their mindset and in terms of, actually in terms of uh, oftentimes their personality as well. Um, is, the, is a motivation for a serial killer important? Yes, it is, because there are groups of serial killers and their motivation distinguishes them. So there are serial killers, for example, that work in hospitals and they kill their patients. There are uh, people that would qualify under the definition of two or more people uh, being murdered over days, weeks, months, or years, and they can belong to a gang. I know in Northern Virginia, we um, certainly have our problems with gangs. And for uh, initiation into the gangs, gang members can be required to kill two or more people. So the motivation in that case would be to become eligible to join a gang in the hospital. They kill for different reasons. I dealt mostly with serial killers that killed for sexual reasons. They were sexually turned on by the act of actually killing another human being. So the motivation does make a difference and we would um, be very specific in order to make sure uh, to begin with what the motivation is. And I know people are following the news right now on the, um, the young man that um, shot um, former President Trump and 
we they are going back and forth and back and forth about what's the motivation, what's the motivation. And I will tell you in that case, I'm not trying to blend together the two, the two types of crimes, but in that case, there will be multiple motivations. In serial sexual killers, there are also multiple motivations. I am not aware of one crime that I ever investigated as a law enforcement person where the offender had one single motivation for why they did what they did. But I'm going to talk to you today about a, the group of sexually uh, motivated serial killers who kill primar primarily for sexual gratification. Now, is it nature or is it nurture? We get asked that question a lot. Are you born a serial killer or do you become a serial killer? Well, here's the interesting thing about um, nature and nurture. Nature and nurture um, is so tightly intertwined, there really is no way to pull them apart and say, okay, this I can attribute to your nature. This I can attribute to to the way that you were raised. We cannot do that. They are so intertwined. And we know from research on um, how offenders develop over time that a serial sexual killer, um, that behavior is part nature and it's part nurture. And I'm gonna tell you what I mean by that. But first, let me tell you what Hollywood's versions are of a serial killer and why is this important? I'll tell you why this is important, because frequently going out and doing interviews when working on a serial murder case, I would ask people, what do you think we're looking for? And that description in people's minds is what causes them to focus on absol absolutely the wrong person. Um, I just heard that Silence of the Lamb, that famous movie from the mid-1990s, is coming out again. But oftentimes people will think of Dr. Hannibal Lecter as kind of the prime example of a serial sexual killer. It's a, I found this to be a terrifying movie. People believe that Dr. Um, Hannibal Lecter was based on a real person. He was not. There We've never had a Dr. Hannibal Lecter um, come through the FBI or any law enforcement agency. And he was created in a way that would be kind of particularly terrifying to, um, to people that would see this movie. We have medical doctors, yes, who were, who were and are um, serial killers, but Dr. Hannibal Lecter was as creepy as you can get, yet he looked fairly normal, but his own behavior was such that it was just absolutely off-putting. And I'm going to contrast that with the serial killers that I've talked to. And I promise you, you could sit next to them on the Metro and absolutely have no idea uh, what they did in their um, secret and private life. Um, another example is Freddy Krueger from Hollywood. People want to look at someone and just be able to tell from their physical appearance that they are violent and very dangerous and you need to stay away. And that's simply not the case with a serial sexual killer, which is why people get duped into trusting them to open their front doors to them, to um, going out um, somewhere, to allowing their children to go with them because they don't look like uh, a Freddy Krueger. The terms that we as a society ascribe to people that are violent is a problem. And it's not just a problem in these cases, it's a problem with violent crime in general. When there is something that occurs on the media, almost immediately you will hear people who are the spokesperson for whatever the agency is, and they will say, whoever committed this heinous crime has to be insane. Are you kidding me? Before we've even identified the person, you know that they have mental health issues. Maybe they do, but oftentimes maybe they don't. And to say that someone is insane implies that they don't know right from wrong. And the people that I'm talking about today know right from wrong. They know what the laws are, but the rules and the laws don't apply, for, don't apply to them. They are not insane. Oftentimes you'll hear a person that will go into the media and say, whoever committed this crime has to be crazy, has to be a monster. 
And as recently as last week, I heard that descriptor used in describing a violent offender. That catapults us back to the 14th century, where people believed that werewolves were responsible for serial murders and for other violent crimes. And yet we still hold on to those concepts of what makes somebody dangerous. And then, of course, there's the term evil. We'll say whoever did this has to be evil. Evil is a spiritual term. It has no place in law enforcement. It has no place in behavioral assessment. It Again, it's a spiritual term, and it doesn't help to describe um, the offender's behavior and the offender's, specifically the offender's crime scene behavior. And I can promise you that nowhere in the textbooks that I had to read as an FBI agent, as an FBI profiler, um, and in getting my PhD, did I ever have a chapter that said, this is how you interview an evil person, or this is how you prosecute a monster. So these concepts get in our way, and they still do get in our way today. So words matter and labels can affect how we view people and what we think that they are capable of doing. So I like to tell my classes, be very careful about the labels you use when you're talking about violent offenders, especially serial sexual killers. Now, there are some theories that have come out about serial sexual killers, and we can't seem to get rid of them. And the top two theories of about serial sexual killers are that somehow they just snapped. And one day they woke up, they were perfectly fine yesterday, but today they woke up and they decided they wanted to go out and just kill two or more people over the next two, three, 10 years. People don't snap. People don't um, wake up overnight and decide to take on a whole new lifestyle. So the snap theory is one that I still hear used when people are trying to describe behavior, oh, he must have just snapped. No, that's not how it happened. And that's really important for an investigator because we know that when um, offenders begin to act out as serial sexual killers, it's often in their late teens and early 20s. And what we have to do as profilers to go back and understand their criminal behavior, we have to look for their practice murders, which preexisted at least probably um, five years before they actually became really good and we could therefore call them a serial murder. So the snap theory is not alive and it's it's not well and it, and it certainly does get in the way. The other theory that people have about people that engage in this kind of behavior is that it's a straggly haired stranger that just came to town. And by the time the crimes have been discovered, the straggly haired stranger is on Interstate 95 or Interstate 10 or whatever your interstate is where you are, and they're out of town. We do have um, a number, and I'll tell you about them, um, serial sexual killers that, that um, drive from coast to coast. Uh, that was particularly a problem in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, and they picked up their victims. And by the time their victim um, was murdered, that individual was in another part of the United States. But we very frequently have cases, I'm still working cold cases today, serial murder cases, um, and, the, and the offender lives right down the block or lives in, in the next cul-de-sac over. So they're not the straggly-haired stranger that looks like um, Charlie Manson here. And if you look at this uh, at this picture with a man who appears to be a dog lover, and it, this is not a trick question. I mean, there's nothing about this individual that would be um, um, alarming. Um, there's nothing about this individual physically that would cause someone to um, necessarily stand back and jump to conclusions that uh, there's something about about this person that causes me to be concerned about him. And if we had time, I would talk to you about all the belief systems that we all had about if you look at somebody and they don't look you in the eye, that means they're dangerous. I can tell you that's an old wives tale. That's not true. Um, but we all were raised with certain beliefs about other people that told us dangerous, not dangerous. I can tell you growing up in a family of of animal lovers, I was raised to believe that if you did not love animals, I mean, in a passionate way, my mother told us there's something wrong with that person. 
And so then I grow up to become an FBI agent and I'm in people's homes and I'm interviewing them and I'm trying to build rapport when I first get there. And of course, one of the first things that I say as an animal lover is, oh, do you have any animals? Do you own any pets? I'd love to meet your pets. And how many people would tell me, oh, no, we don't have pets in our new house. No, no, no. And I would write that down like, OK, no pets. Red flag. No, it wasn't. I was just raised that everybody loves animals as much as, as I did. But I see this picture. Looks like, a um, you know, a, just a, a regular guy, um, somebody that is holding two dogs. And yet... This man is responsible for at least 51 murders in one county in Seattle, Washington. He traveled all over the United States, but we could only talk with him about the murders in, in Seattle because of an agreement that we had with the prosecutors. But he pled guilty to 51 murders in Seattle. That normal looking man that you just saw is actually um, Gary Ridgway, the Green River serial killer, who is one of our most prolific serial sexual killers in the United States. And he was someone who was, uh, he had, um, he was married at the time. He worked at the same job for 30 years. The belief is that these are drifters. They don't have a job. That really is simply not true. He had a son. Um, at times he, uh, he went to church and the reason he flew under the radar screen for such a long period of time is because he did come across in, in such a very, um, very normal way. We tested this video before we started, and I apologize. Uh, this is from one of the interviews that I did do with Gary. Uh, there was a team that interviewed him for a period of months because the agreement was with Gary, that if he took investigators to the location where he dumped some of his uh, some of his victims, they would take the death penalty off the table, and he would be given life without the possibility of parole, which is what happened. But they didn't strike that agreement until they talked to the victims' families of uh, women who were still missing and explained what the agreement would be. And I thought that was really um, a, a an amazing step for the prosecutor to do that. And the families that still had missing loved ones wanted to find out where they were. So that agreement was struck. And Gary Ridgway is still incarcerated um, out in the state of Washington. But we interviewed him for a very long period of, of time in an effort to uh, determine who were the people that he victimized and once he killed them, where did he put the bodies? And that's, um, I'm sitting there next to Gary. I'm sitting very close to him. I'm not the only one, though, that interviewed him. We had a team of prosecutors and homicide investigators, and they were incredibly talented interviewers. But you can see he's sitting there, and behind us are the, his defense attorneys. But I think just by looking at him, um, he's very soft-spoken. He's very... He was um, very responsive to questions. He had insights into why he did what he did. And he would, um, he'd spend hours talking to us ab about his crimes. And I think had it not been for the orange jumpsuit, as he sits there, he's not a very threatening individual. And that's the way a lot of these people come across. They're not out of touch with reality. They're very cognizant of um, what their behavior is. And one of the things that I find so interesting in my interviews with Gary, as well as with other serial killers, is they're very proud of their behavior. They're very proud of being able to have gotten away with it. They're proud of their behavior that they feel that they were very good at what they did. Gary felt like he was um, probably the top serial killer in the United States, even compared to Ted Bundy, because they operated um, at the same time up in the Seattle area. It's a, uh, you don't, you can't go into these interviews expecting remorse um, over what they've done because it's not there. And and so I, I, I teach interviewing and, and what we talk about is you have to go into the interview 
interviews on their terms and not on your terms, and they don't feel remorse um, over their actions. And I'll talk just briefly about that in a, in a second. So how and why does someone um, become a serial killer? We find in the FBI, there were two reasons. Um, it's, a, it's the result of a severe personality disorder, which is not a mental illness, and what we call paraphilic behaviors. And I'll tell you what those are. And it's that combination of a severe personality disorder known as psychopathy and uh, paraphilic uh, behaviors. But after all of that is said and done, it's freedom of choice. They don't have to do this. They don't have to to engage in this behavior. This is behavior they choose to engage in. They enjoy this behavior. And in fact, they will follow other serial sexual killers to learn how to do it better. And they, many of them enjoy the cat and mouse game uh, with law enforcement. So the uh, a paraphilic behavior is one of the two elements that we see in the FBI. So I wanted to just briefly tell you what that is. What is a paraphilia? It's a fancy word for um, a group of persistent sexual behaviors uh, which are unusual or um, deviant. And the serial killer, if, if it is a serial sexual killer, in other words, he's engaging in, in this behavior for sexual reasons, that paraphilic behavior will have to be present at the crime scene because that's the reason that he's engaging in this criminal behavior. And the interesting thing about paraphilic behaviors is we think for the most part they're learned behaviors, but at a very early age. The etiology of paraphilic behaviors is the result of childhood trauma, traumatic events in early childhood, sexual uh, or physical um, physical abuse or sexual abuse. And what's really frightening to me, and I've seen it over and over again, um, the the damage that can be done to someone uh, between the ages of zero and five. And in these cases, that's what I have found is the, is the uh, trauma is very severe, it's ongoing, and it occurs between the ages of zero to five. Now, are there a lot of people that go through childhood trauma and they never go on to become serial sexual killers? Absolutely. So we are talking about a very small percentage of people, but I'm just trying to um, give you the picture of what we've seen in the background of serial sexual killers. So we don't want to put that, that blanket on, on everyone that goes through a traumatic childhood. But early childhood trauma uh, that's ongoing and happens at an early age um, can be devastating for a variety of reasons. When I um, um, talk to these serial sexual killers about their particular paraphilic behaviors, um, they will tell me that it was something that they knew they were um, involved with at a very early age and that the behavior feels very normal for them. So they, they know it's off. They know it's deviant. They may know it's wrong, but it feels normal for them. Um, and they can recall that it started to show manifest itself uh, at a very early age. Let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about of some paraphilic behaviors, and the list is endless. These are some examples that I've seen from some cases that I've worked on. Pedophilia is sexual attraction to children. We've had serial sexual killers who are pedophiles, and so they will specifically target um, very young children. Um, exhibitionism is another paraphilic behavior um, that is very prominent in serial sexual um, murder cases. Gerontophilia is sexual attraction to elderly victims. Fetish, fetishism is sexual attraction to an unusual object. I had one serial sexual killer that um, had to be wearing the victim's high-heeled shoes before he could be sexually aroused. So that there was that attraction to um, an object which is called fetish, fetishism. Um, necrophilia is a lot more common that one than what you might think, and that's sexual attraction to human corpses. Um, Gary Ridgway, it took him uh, weeks before he would tell us that he was into necrophilia, which was part of the reason that he 
um, committed the murders that he committed. Ted Bundy was also into necrophilia. Somalophilia, which is sexual attraction to a comatose, near comatose victims. I worked a case that went on for, a, it actually went on for 40 years, but we didn't arrest the person until they were 60. They had no criminal record. It doesn't mean criminal activity was absent, but I, it's just interesting that there was no criminal behavior. And once I saw the, the um, some of the um, crime scene evidence, it became apparent to me that his victims um, as they were being um, tortured, were had actually been drugged. And that made me think that he was actually um, uh, into the sexual attraction to people that were nearly comatose or near comatose victims, in which case then his para one of his paraphilic behaviors would have been uh, somalophilia. And then sexual sadism, which is sexual attraction to torturing um, victims. These sound very severe and they, and they, are, but as a profiler, when I look at a crime scene that's been committed by a serial sexual offender, I have to figure out why did he commit this sex crime and what is the sexual parts of that crime? And they're not traditional. So I have to understand, are, are shoes taken? Does he have a shoe fetish? Did he torture the victim? Which means that he could be into sexual sadism. And why is that important? Because if I don't know who that offender is, but I'm, I know it's likely that he's going to reoffend. then I know that the next crime will also include these paraphilic behaviors. That's why they're so important to be able to understand. The next component to understanding um, a serial sexual killer is their personality. And you're, are, you and I, all of us have a unique personality. A serial sexual killer, on the other hand, um, has a very unique personality disorder. And that disorder is called psychopathy. Some people use the term sociopath, but that's an old term that was actually thrown out in 1968. And the new term is, is psychopath. Psychopathy is a very severe and devastating personality disorder, but it's not a mental illness. It has certain features to it, and I'm going to show you what those features are. Psychopaths tend to be very cold-blooded individuals, and they have no empathy for other people. It's just not there. And in talking to these serial sexual killers over the years, uh, I have certain questions that I ask them. I have certain questions that I don't ask them, though, because it will derail my interview with them. And one of the things I don't talk to them about is how they feel about what they did to the victims or the damage that they did to the victims' families, which is generational. That's a very important topic. However, a serial sexual killer, we estimate in the FBI about 95% of serial sexual killers are psychopathic. That tells me that they have absolutely no empathy for their victims. If I attempt to focus the interview on the victims, I will lose the interview because these offenders could care less about the victims. So it's important that I work within their personality um, constraints and restraints. And I said, is a psychopath the same thing as a sociopath? No, the research that's been done over the last 50 years on psychopathy has really included um, such scientific review as, as looking at their brains to see, is there anything from that perspective that distinguishes a psychopath from non-psychopathic individuals? And in fact, there, there are um, differences um, based on um, functional MRIs that have been done on individuals that are psychopathic. Areas of the brain um, are very different for them than they are for those of us who are non-psychopathic. So a psychopath's pathology is well beneath the surface. So you can look at a Gary Ridgway or a Ted Bundy um, or several uh, other people I'll mention here shortly, and you don't see anything uh, wrong with, with them. And they can come across as um, interested in you and kind and, and um, gracious. They tend to be very glib and charming individuals. I recall... Um, going to interview one offender. I had just come from his torture chamber where he tortured his victims. And it was quite a sophisticated um, chamber that he had um, um, filled with uh, equipment. But I went to the jail to meet him. He had wanted to meet the profiler. And I 
watched him walk towards me down the hallway and he was very tall and a slender man, but he had um, a warm smile on his face and he came up to me. He was, he had um, two deputies on either side who let us speak in the room and, um, you know, have as much a confidential interview as we could. But I recall that he took my hand in both of his hands, even though he was handcuffed, he took my hand in both of his hands and in a very warm and gracious way, he said, oh, Mary Allen, it's so nice to meet you. I, I really appreciate your coming down here and talking with me. It's, I know how busy you are. Can I get you a cup of coffee or some water or something? I'm thinking to myself, we're kind of in like a jail and this isn't your living room, but I said, no, thank you. And we sat down and, and, um, he just started to talk and I kept having to remind myself, Mary Ellen, don't forget what you know about this behavior because he was so glib and so very charming and it completely solidified for me how he was able to convince victims to go with him because of his, of his charming um, personality. So how do we physically tell psychopaths apart from um, us? We don't. We physically, there's nothing physically that's off-putting about this. So let me tell you a little bit more about psychopathy and serial murders. In my research in the FBI, what I did was I took all the 20 traits of a psychopath and I put them, kind of overlaid them over serial murder scenes to see if I could see those traits in the murder scenes. And I felt that there were some of the traits of a psychopath that I could see in serial um, sexual murder scenes. So let me tell you what psychopaths are, are like. Let me give you some of their traits. And remember, we think 95% of serial sexual killers have these traits. A psychopath has 20 traits and they fall together like a cluster of grapes. And if you are a psychopath in... South Korea, and I say that because I was able to go there and do training on psychopathy, or if you're a psychopath in um, South America, we did training down there, or in Ireland, the beauty of the research, which is so powerful, is this. The same traits exist for individuals who are psychopathic in Seoul, South Korea, who are psych psychopathic in Santiago, Chile, who are psychopathic in Dublin, Ireland, and who are psychopathic in Fairfax, Virginia. These 20 traits are applicable with a few cultural, uh, cultural um, um, differences, but the traits will be the same, which is incredible. The ability, therefore, it gives people like me who are crime scene analysts um, to be able to talk in terms of what law enforcement should be look, looking for in terms of the personality of the um, suspect in their case. So psychopaths have this devastating personality disorder known as psychopathy. They don't have deep feelings for people. And this means, this is a tough one to swallow. I remember getting into quite a verbal discourse with a psychiatrist on this issue. This means that psychopaths who are serial sexual killers, but they're psychopathic in their personality structure, they don't go home and love on their partner and their children. They don't do that. They simply don't. They do not bond with anybody. Many people think a serial killer can go home and turn that switch off like a light switch. That's preposterous. That doesn't happen. They do not. They they may be fond of their children, they may be fond of their partner, but they don't have that deep seated love that non-psychopathic individuals have for family members. Psychopaths don't, the rules don't apply to them in society. They have a significant sense of entitlement. They're grandiose, which is uh, more severe than narcissism. They're very grandiose and they believe that they are smarter, better, um, than anybody in the universe. They lack absolutely no remorse for their actions, but they're not out of touch with reality and they don't believe there's anything wrong with them. There is a test for psychopathy. It's called the PCLR, which is um, an acronym for psychopathy checklist revised. 
the um it's considered the gold standard to assess someone for psychopathy. We have white collar psychopaths. We have sex offenders who are psychopaths who are not serial killers. And then we have serial sexual killers. A serial sexual killer will probably score higher than any other type of offender. Um, the score on the PCLR is zero to 40. You don't want to get a 40. That's that's a perfect score, but that would be oh so bad. I think I met one, um, one serial sexual killer that scored a 40. Most serial sexual killers you can expect would score in the high 30s or mid to high 30s. Um, with white collar psychopaths who are not at all murderers, they may score um, in the 20s. And then average people like us who are not psychopathic, if I were to give you the PCLR, I would expect that you might score uh, a six or seven or an eight. But yes, I, I get asked that question and there is a test for a little bit more on, on that. There is a test for um, psychopathy. So I'm going to show you the traits of a psychopath, which are the traits of serial sexual killers. The traits are are uh, put into four categories. Interpersonally, how would a psychopath act if they were sitting here with me today? Um, what are their feelings? How do they live their life? And then the antisocial, are they, um, at what point do they become antisocial in our society? And what do we look for? Um, in their backgrounds, especially I'm always interested in someone that goes on to become a serial sexual killer. I'm always interested in their childhood. How did they behave in their teen years? How did they behave? And then when they get to be in their early 20s, how did they begin to behave? And that antisocial behavior doesn't, again, just pop up in the mid 20s. You see the behavior starting to pop up when they are generally in their teen years. So these are the key traits of psychopathy. You're not going to see anything on here that said they're prone to murder. There is no murder gene. There is no murder gene. So that's why when you go back to piece together how someone becomes so severely criminal, you really have to pull together the psychology of it and the science of it and the medicine of it and really have to, um, to take a look at how this behavior develops. Um, a very good friend of mine um, was an, a, a neuroscientist, and I, I agree with his philosophy on violence. Violence really does begin in the brain. Violence begins in the brain, and that's certainly applicable here because these serial sexual killers have thought about murdering people for a very long time before they started to act out. And that that's usually um, pretty true of a lot of criminal behavior. Somebody doesn't wake up one morning and just become a mass shooter. They think about it, they plan it, they take steps to move themselves forward. Violence begins in the brain. The more we learn about the human brain, the more I think we're going to be able to um, address some of these issues in terms of, um, of violence and when we can intercede. So let me just tell you a little bit more specifically about psychopaths. Again, they tend to be very glib and charming individuals. If you meet them, they're very extroverted. They know how to talk. They know how to allay your concerns and your fears. They're very grandiose. They believe that they are smarter, um, more accomplished than anybody else in the room. They are pathological liars. And I certainly have found this in interviews. They will lie about everything. So one day we might go in and talk to Gary uh, Ridgway and he would tell us about a case. And then the next day we would go back in, talk about the same case and, and he would rescind what he said yesterday. They're very, they can be very frustrating to talk to and they will lie about everything, even if it's minor, even if it's about the color of their socks, things they don't have to lie about, they will lie. Uh, these individuals tend to be very conning and manipulative. And if, if you do work in law enforcement or in corrections or in mental health, you need to know that because when you go in to do interviews with them, um, they will be expert at, at, at conning and manipulating you. They will, they want your, it's like they are a puppeteer, um, the the person that handles the the strings on a puppet. They will 
they will pull those strings and try to get things out of you as the interviewer, as the FBI agent, as the profiler, whether it's, hey, if I tell you this, will you put me in a different prison? I hate it here. Or, hey, if you tell me this, will you will you bring me something the next time you come to see me? So they're very manipulative. Um, lack remorse and guilt for what they do. Their affect is very shallow, So, which means their emotional life is very shallow. Are they concerned about being psychopaths? Are they concerned about having shallow affect? The individuals that I've talked to, they are not. They are not at all. In fact, they feel that if you have emotions, that's kind of a weakness because you are held back, you being you and me and all non-psychopaths, we are um, kind of restrained by our emotions. Um, serial sexual killers who are psychopathic, they fail to accept responsibility for their, uh, for their behavior. And I saw that repeatedly in interviews with these individuals. Once we did arrest them and bring them in, they would tend to uh, blame the victims um, in their crimes for what happened. And as an interviewer, you might be very offended by that. You're, you're blaming the victim. You killed her. You're blaming her. But as an interviewer, you have to be very careful that you don't judge, that you don't argue that. You're there simply to collect um, as much information as you can. And sometimes it's very difficult. And not everybody can do an interview because your first impulse may be to jump in and say, how dare you blame the victim? But you have to understand the personality. And in order to get through a, an interview and, and hopefully a semi-successful interview, you have to sit and, and do a tremendous amount of listening without judging. Um, one of the traits I'm going to talk to you about in terms of their crime scenes, these are individuals that love thrill-seeking in their, in their crimes. They will import behaviors into their serial murder cases that they don't have to import into their crime scenes, and yet they do it to make the crime itself more exciting. Um, these individuals tend to be impulsive, um, very irresponsible. They live uh, parasitic lifestyles. It doesn't mean that they are all living on the street. That's certainly not the case at all. When I say they live parasitic lifestyles, I mean they use other people. Um, and obviously they do that in their crime scenes. Um, from an antisocial perspective, as especially as juveniles, these are people with uh, poor behavior controls. And there's evidence of this um, these psychopathic traits, again, manifesting at earlier ages. And that includes um, uh, behaviors that are consistent with juvenile delinquency. And what I always tell my classes is, is this, when you go back and you look at somebody's criminal background, my students, some of whom are, are military or law enforcement, they may come back and say, we didn't find anything in their juvenile background. And I said, that doesn't, the absence of a criminal record does not mean criminal behavior is absent. So go back and look. It doesn't mean little Johnny didn't, little Johnny didn't get arrested for a crime. Does that mean little Johnny didn't do something? No. So it may not be on a rap sheet someplace, but you have to go back and take a look at what was Gary like at 10 years old? What was Gary like at 12 and at 15 and at 18? It doesn't mean he was arrested for things that he did, but it's it it doesn't rule out the fact that there could have been some criminal behavior that he got, basically that he got away with. So when I looked at the crime scenes of, of serial sexual killers, knowing that psychopathy played a very prominent role and who these people were, I decided to do some research on their crime scenes to see if their scenes were different from other kinds of, of, of offenders. And if those traits that I just covered with you could be seen in their crime scenes. And yes, they could, as a matter of fact. So some key traits of psychopathy, one of the ones that's um, the three that are the most compelling for me are, can I see um, in a crime scene, a serial crime scene, how do I tell if the offender was glib and charming? How can I tell if the offender lacked remorse for the victims? How can I tell if the serial killer um, was um, a thrill seeker? And here's how I did it. So number one, glib and charming. If I looked at, in one case I had the, um, 
the offender went up to the um to the victims and was able and was able to convince them to go with him and we knew that because when we found the victims there were no obvious signs of physical trauma on the body no defensive injuries and so the question was early on did the victims know this person because did they trust them because they knew them and we went through we eliminated that as a possibility because we went through all of their close friends and their relatives and their associates and found that it's not likely that these the victims in this particular case knew the offender so then we defaulted to okay then we think it must be somebody that they didn't know but how was it that these victims didn't fight off their offender who eventually was able to subdue them and actually you know murder them and then it became that this offender had to have almost in just super um powerful interpersonal skills to the point that they were able to walk up to the victims and charm them and talk to them in such a way that the victims who were very, very smart, very astute, the victims did not feel threatened by what they did. Um, we went on that premise because we did not have any defensive injuries on the victims. You have to be able to explain that. If you don't have defensive injuries, something accounts for that. Um, when I actually ended up talking to a survivor in this series of murders and asked her, how did this person approach you? What was it about this person that caused you to lo lower your guard? Because I can tell you, you are a very, um, um, intuitive person. How was it that you lowered your guard and, and let this person, um, in your kind of your safety zone? And they told me they said this was one of the number one best looking men I've ever seen. And number two, soft spoken, sweet, charming, polite, and just didn't see a, a shred, just did not see a shred of, of threatening behavior coming coming through. Um that's why this victim and the other victims let their guard down. There was nothing about this person. And you may say, well, I would never allow that to happen. Well, we say that. And yet sometimes when you, when you think back over your lifetime, how often has it ever happened that you did let it happen? And these victims did it at the wrong time with the right person. And I ultimately went on to meet this offender once they were apprehended. And I can tell you all of those traits glib, charming, sweet, handsome. They were all there. Absolutely all there. Um, the next trait that is in the psychopathic construct is no remorse, no empathy. I will tell you this, that um, many people who murder other people are very remorseful for what they do, and they feel terrible for what they do. And there are other motivations for why they commit murder. So all people who commit murder are not psychopaths. Certainly the vast majority are, are not. Uh, but in those cases where I'm trying to analyze unsolved serial murder cases, I have to better understand, or am I looking for someone who's psychopathic? Because that's a whole different area of, of um, investigation I have to go to. And how do I tell that? Um, here, here are ways that I've uh, did, um, discerned that in cases that I've worked with. If the victims, again, serial murder is uh, to murder two or more victims over days or weeks or months or years. If there are multiple cases already that I'm working on, I look at the victims. If victims have been murdered, let's say, and tortured, and this offender does it over and over again, maybe over a period of six months, and the victim... Um, disposes of the body in location. So the body is going to be shocking and found by the person that owns the house where the body is left on the front yard. If there are other things done to degrade the victim by the offender, the serial killer, then that tells me that this is somebody that has no remorse for that victim, for what they did to that victim and no empathy for that victim. 
And that if they continue to murder, this is what they're going to do is to show that callous disregard for the victim. And when I go in and conduct the interview, I have to be prepared for somebody that has those feelings towards the victim. And I better darn well be sure that if they don't have those um, concerns for the victim, I've got to be on my guard because they don't have um, any feelings of respect or concern for me uh, either. So that was the second trait. And then the third trait that I looked for in my kind of in my research is, is this a um, psychopath that he's killing people? Maybe he's going into their home and killing them, or maybe he's picking them up at a pub or some other place. But he, is he particularly needy of sensation seeking? In other words, it's bad enough if you murder someone and then you dispose of their body. But is he doing extra things in the crime scene to make the crime more exciting? For him. And with psychopaths, um, most psychopathic individuals will purposely uh, do things in their crime scene to make the crime more exciting. Sometimes when I would ask them about it, did you know that you committed the crime in front of an open window with no curtains? And there were like people outside. <laughs> and I've had them say, no, I didn't even notice that. Um, I promise you, you and I would notice that. If we were inside of somebody's home committing a terrible crime like that, we would notice that. But they almost are um, immune to knowing that they are engaging in extra behavior that's considered high risk and could expose them to being identified or apprehended. Um, but they will take certain risks at the crime scene that they certainly don't have to take because it makes the crime more important, more exciting for them. And some of the things that I've seen in cases that they've done is they'll take, uh, they'll go into the victim's home where they have no business being. They don't live there. They've never been given permission. They go in and that's very high risk to go into somebody's home, commit a violent crime. But some serial sexual killers will do that it's, it's very risky for them, but it ups the excitement of the crime on their part. I've had some serial killers commit crimes actually in front of potential witnesses, or they'll approach their victims in front of witnesses. And a good example of that is um, Ted Bundy. Back in the 70s, he would approach young women in the beach areas um, in the state of Washington, and he would go up, start a conversation. There were other people around um, and he would have a conversation and he would convince these young girls to help him with something. He, he would allege that his arm was broken and he needed help putting something in his vehicle. But he was seen doing all of that. He didn't wear a mask on his face. He had a lot of confidence, but it was just more exciting to do start to commit the crime in front of other people. It makes it it makes it more exciting. Uh, we've all heard of Ted. He's probably the poster boy for um, he's probably the poster board for serial sexual murder, and he still continues to be um, a, a poster board. Well, one of the things that I find most interesting about him is that um, he does he does manifest all those traits that allowed him to get away with his crimes for such a long period of time. I don't know if um, if, if everyone in this uh, group uh, reads uh, the mystery novels, but if you if you do, you'll recognize the name Anne Rule, R-U-L-E. And Anne was a police woman in the late 60s. They You could be in police work, but they called you a police woman. And then um, after doing that, Anne left and she became um, a writer and she wrote about real life cases and she was very successful. She wrote a book called The Stranger Beside Me, which was a book about Ted Bundy. And Anne and I became very good friends. And um, I liked Anne very much. And she would go and sit through long trials and write a book about the offender. And Anne told me that at night she volunteered um, on a suicide hotline and she said sitting across the table from her was Ted Bundy. He too was sitting. He was taking calls from people that were suicidal, calling in for help in the middle of the night. And during the investigation, when Ted began, began to develop as a suspect in the case, people recognized his Volkswagen and then recognized uh, um, him. 
law enforcement talked with Anne about Ted because they knew she was aware of him. And in fact, Anne said there were times Aunt Ted would walk her to her car after they were done with their shift. And I remember Ann telling me, Mary Ellen, all the work I've done on serial murders and my work as a policewoman and my work as a writer, I never, ever saw this coming. Never saw it coming. And Anne was brilliant and very perceptive and she never saw it coming. Just a... Um, a look at some of Ted's um, victims. It's interesting because right before Ted was um, put to death, he gave a lot of interviews. Um, I, I did not interview Ted, but he did give a lot of interviews and investigators were asking him um, if this was the reason that he picked some of his victims was because of their hairstyle. And he said, no, that's just how young women wore their hair in the late sixties, long parted down the middle. He said he picked um, he picked women that he thought were worthy of him. Can you even imagine? He picked victims who he thought were worthy of him. That's the grandiosity um, coming out um, in in him. Originally, detectives were looking for um, someone that was a monster. And then they, as they began to figure out more about what made him um, tick, they realized that he was actually a human predator. And that's hard to put into context. These are human predators. Um, his charm and his good looks were able to get him to get victims to lower their guards. Um, and then when the victims would get close to his VW, that's when he would um, hit them, usually with something similar to a crowbar and push them into his vehicle. But for the longest time, he did not um, he did not surface as a suspect, and people were uh, back in the in the um, late sixties and early seventies when he was uh, his crimes were being investigated. They were talking about how they were looking for a monster because of the necrophilia they found at the crime scenes, because of the mutilation and the bludgeoning of the victims of the ones that they could find. They found uh, many skeletonized remains and the hunting behavior. And they equated that to um, whoever did this was a monster. And yet um, you could see that that certainly was not the case when he was identified and apprehended. I wanna tell you a little bit about this case. It's also a case, I think my students think that I'm a history, uh, I'm a history major. I'm a history buff, not a history major, but uh, the Zodiac was a case that I did work on. And because I, uh, my first, field office was the San Francisco FBI field office. I did some work on the Zodiac case, but prior to going into the FBI in, in the San Francisco division, I was an investigator with the San Francisco district attorney's office um, in the mid 1970s and um, did some things on the Zodiac case then. And it's an interesting case because we still don't know who Zodiac is. So let me tell you a little bit about this unknown serial sexual killer uh, back in the 60s and give you some ideas ab about his crime scene behavior. Um, Zodiac, whoever he is or whoever he was, also engaged in some very high risk behavior and had a complete lack of remorse uh, for his victims. Just by way of background, um, Zodiac uh, killed uh, couples on lover's lanes in Northern California, but he did more. He's believed to be responsible for uh, multiple deaths down on the peninsula. He also uh, killed a um, an individual I'm gonna tell you about here shortly. And where his, his real claim to uh, fame came was Zodiac engaged in behavior which most serial sexual killers don't. He took credit publicly for his crimes and after committing some of the murders in the lover's lane, he would notify the police and tell them where the bodies were. Um, he would contact the San Francisco Chronicle and he would brag about himself. And after one particular murder, he sent evidence to the newspaper and told them that he was responsible. That's ridiculous to do that because you're what you're doing is you're catapulting yourself back into the investigation and you're providing law enforcement with more forensic evidence. 
But if you're in, if you're a thrill seeking, love, high risk, excitement, kind of a serial sexual killer psychopath, that's exactly um, what you do. And that's what Zodiac um, did. This is Paul Stein. Paul Stein um, was a, a, a quiet guy. He drove a taxi cab in San Francisco. Paul Stein had nothing to do with a lover's lane. He wasn't part of a couple's. Uh, he simply drove a taxi cab to earn a living. And one night he was parked at a hotel where the taxis line up and he was dispatched to pick up Zodiac. But of course he didn't know it was Zodiac. And from what investigators were able to put together, um, this will, I, I only put this grab this um, notice up here. You will, you will not be able to see the, the graphic crime scene photographs. Um, you, you will see Paul laid over on the seat, but it's, it's really um, very vague. And I, I blurred it out. Zodiac was in the back seat of the taxi cab. Apparently, just, and there's no reason to think that Zodiac knew Paul Stein or that Paul knew um, Zodiac. They didn't have cell phones, obviously, back then, but Paul did have access to the taxi radio, which he was able to speak into. And he dispatched radio that he was going to drop his, um, his ride off in a certain part of San Francisco, which um, was is a very exclusive part of San Francisco. It's, it, I think it's still, I haven't been back. San Francisco is my hometown. I haven't been back there in quite a long time, but it's still quite a nice area of San Francisco. And so Paul drove Zodiac to that part of, of San Francisco. He apparently, Paul pulled over to the curb. Zodiac said, no, go a little further. So Paul drove a little bit further, but look at, the time of day that these pictures were taken. This was day, this was evening, but it was still light out. And these homes had people in them. And there were kids outside playing. And Zodiac decided, sitting in the back seat, that he was going to shoot Paul in the back of the head. And he did. In front of witnesses, in front of people. That's what I'm talking about, that high risk behavior. And back in the day when this was happening, investigators said, oh, whoever did this has got to be crazy to do that. It is a built-in feature of psychopathy, which is a built-in feature of serial sexual killers. So Zodiac, Zodiac gets out of the back seat of the cab. He walks to the, to the front seat of the cab. He's seen pushing Paul over. And he's seen like wiping something down. Presumably it was maybe the, the dashboard. He pushes Paul over. So when officers, detectives get there, that's why Paul kind of falls over the front seat of the car. But the uh, witnesses were not able to see exactly what Zodiac was, was doing in the front seat of the car. So he, he remained in the car for a short period of time. And then he got out and just walked away. He did not run away. He walked away. And in fact, reportedly he had walked by that time, police were called and apparently Zodiac might've actually walked by several police officers as he's walking away from the scene and may have even had words with them as they're responding to the murder scene. Very high risk behavior for um, Zodiac to engage in. But then within a day or so, the San Francisco Chronicle gets the following message, note, with a bloody shirt, which is part of Paul's shirt. So while Zodiac was in the car, he managed to cut off a piece of Paul Stein's shirt and he sent this note um, into the Chronicle, taking credit for what he had done. And he says, this is the Zodiac speaking. I am the murderer of the taxi driver over by Washington Street and Maple Street last night. To prove this, here is a bloodstained piece of his shirt. 
I am the same person who did in the people in the North Bay area, the Lover's Lane. The San Francisco police could have caught me last night if they had searched the park properly instead of holding road games with their motorcycles, seeing who could make the most noise. School children make nice targets. I can promise you that terrified the citizens of San Francisco when they saw that note. But more as importantly as that is that here you have a serial sexual killer who really embraces his status as a serial sexual killer in the city of San Francisco. He has almost brought San Francisco to its knees because people are terrified. He sends evidence into the San Francisco Chronicle that could absolutely tie him to the case um, and he takes credit for it. So at this point, the motivation for Zodiac sort of changes because it was exciting for him to, to um, commit the murders, but now as he's evolved, it became, I think, evident that he was even more excited about taunting the police, scaring the public, and becoming almost um, a mystical figure in, in San Francisco. Zodiac killer has never been solved. And may never be. So do psychopaths have a preferred type of violence? And I use this all the time it, when I first would get in a case. If I saw a case that had the kind of violence I'm going to show you or describe to you, I'm not going to show you. Um, if I saw that their violence was instrumental, I would start thinking I'm my offender is probably someone who's psychopathic. What's instrumental violence? It's important that as a profiler, I know the difference. Reactive is the most common type of violence that we see. I punch you in the nose, you punch me back. That's the most common type of violence. But instrumental violence is unprovoked. You don't even know me. Just like Zodiac did not know Paul Stein. Um, Paul didn't do anything to incite um, Zodiac killing him. There was no prior relationship between victim and offender in Paul Stein. And that's true in instrumental violence because you say, how could a stranger do that? They didn't even know the victim because psychopathic individuals prefer instrumental violent. And instrumental violent is, tends to be very cold-blooded violence. No feeling of emotion for the victim. So just for me, just knowing is this instrumental or is this... Um, Reactive violence really helps me to hone in on what kind of person I'm looking for. And then what is predatory behavior? Predatory behavior is really interesting. It's hunting behavior. The mindset is there are people out there that are hunting human beings. And sometimes we know with white collar crimes, you also have hunting behavior. They're hunting for vulnerable people that might turn over their passcodes or turn over other information. So hunting behavior exists throughout the criminal world, but I'm talking just about right now, the serial sexual killers and their hunting behavior. And in the interviews that I've done with serial sexual killers, when they talk about the nights they committed the murders, most nights they're not out murdering, but are they out hunting? I call it predating, like predatory. I shorten the term and I'd say, were you up in, engaged in predatory behavior, predating behavior, even though you weren't out murdering? Oh yeah all the time. Let's see, this This hopefully will give you a little, a little bit of a snippet of um, how one serial sexual killer views his predatory behavior. You are about to enter the criminal mindscape of Joseph Paul Franklin. Did you feel like you were actually hunting human beings? Well, I was. You wouldn't call that hunting them? Hunting them and shooting them. On a mission to start a race war in America, Franklin ruthlessly murders 20 people. We're asking him to open up and talk about who he is, his crimes, why he did what he did. The thing we can tell you at this time that we're positive of is that there have been two people shot here at this location. Larry Flint the publisher of Hustler magazine. He and his lawyer were walking down the sidewalk when somebody on the street opened fire. His methods vary, making him nearly impossible to catch. 
We know that they were shot by a sniper. The rifle is a high powered rifle with a scope on it. Remember the two teenage boys in Cincinnati that you shot? You could see that they were young. The well known claims leader said, when I go out to kill rattlesnakes, I don't make any difference between little rattlesnakes and big rattlesnakes because I know the little ones will grow up and bite me when they get big. So I looked at blacks the same way. I totally understand that he will be in control of this interview, and that is the way I'm planning it. Now, a veteran FBI profiler enters death row and steps into the criminal mindscape. Uh, Larry was actually pretty proud of the fact that I used the word predator. I was a little concerned that I would it would be offensive. And again, I don't go into these interviews to be offensive or judgmental. Um, I go in to see if they'd be willing to talk to me. And they don't have to talk to me. He was not offended by the use of that term. In fact, you could see that he he really kind of embraced it. Like, you don't think I was? Like, <laughs> it, it, uh, honestly, it took me back because I, I think he was, in fact, actually proud of his predatory behavior. And he was a very successful predator. As you can tell, um, the fact that he got away with as many um, murders as he got away with. And there, you probably saw it in Larry's eyes. Um, there's something that we call the predatory gaze. And it is a way a psychopath looks at you. They can start off being in an interview and their eyes are bright. They may be blue. They may be green. They may be brown. But they're bright and they're shiny, just like our eyes are. But then there's a certain part time during the interview that they may start to look at you. They're like, I don't like where this interview is going or I don't like what's going on. And, and they can shift and you will see that shifting taking place in their eyes and their eyes will go at half mast and then they become black. And it is so concerning and disconcerting. If you're not prepared for it, um, it will it will cause the hair on the back of your neck um, to go up and you'll feel very uncomfortable. And when I teach interviewing, I want people to be prepared for that switch. If you're in a small interview room, like um, we were with Gary and he developed those, he, um, those predatory eyes that would just go dark because he does have um, blue eyes when they would just go dark like that. Um, you are at risk. Um, that that's, it is a threatening maneuver. It's neurological, so they're not even conscious that they're doing it. But you have to be um, aware that you are at risk for um, uh, for physical harm if they decide they're going to reach across the table. So the eyes of the predator follow you into an interview room. And, and in an interview room, I never lost sight of the fact that I was the prey and they were the predator. I never had someone reach across the table and you know, try to do something to me. I had them threaten me, um, but they never, they would never do that. But I was always cog cognizant of being aware of that shift in their mood, which I could see in their eyes. And if you've ever seen that shift before, even though most of you have probably never been in prison or on death row, there are certainly um, enough psychopathic individuals who are not in prison, who are out in the world, if, if you've seen that shift, it will be very, very disconcerting. So as a uh, law enforcement person, we have to be prepared for that because that prey-predator relationship will follow you into the interview room. Mary Ellen? And at that note, leaving you on the, on the edge of the... Um, the, we call them chameleon eyes and how uncomfortable they can make you feel. I thought this would be a good time to maybe open it up, Debbie, for some Q&A. So we only have five minutes scheduled left, but if- Oh we, dear, I- We can stay because it's a Zoom recording. We can stay a little bit while later if people would like to do that. Sounds good. Can you, can you stay, Mary Ellen? I can, yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> We're all good. 
It was absolutely fascinating to begin with. Uh, one of the first questions that came in was, um, how authentic are the television um, criminal profiler shows, things like Criminal Minds, Mindhunter, even, even Dexter? How accurate is the portrayal of the, uh, the Bureau and the profilers? Um, okay, that's an easy one to answer. I, um, I've never, I didn't watch Dexter. Um, Criminal Minds is, in my, in my opinion, it's not realistic because profilers are just part of a team. We don't do everything like do the profile, then get on a private airplane, then fly out to the crime scene and then do that investigation and then make those arrests and then do that interview and come back. Um, we may be a part of some of that, but we don't do it all. So I didn't feel that represented us um, accurately. Mine hunters, I thought, um, from what I um, have heard, is wonderful. They did a great job. Um, earlier in the early in the program, you talked about narcissists and um, I've forgotten the phrase you used because I used the wrong one. So I'm going to call it sociopath. Is there a common diagnosis or no? Um, no. Um, sociopath is an old mental health term and they don't use it anymore, but it's still out there. Um, narcissism um, is considered a, a mental health uh, disorder. It's not a mental illness. It, it's kind of a standalone, but it can also be a trait within the construct of psychopathy someone that's self-entitled and believes they're um, more important than everybody else. But narcissism is not grandiosity. Grandiosity is like three ratchets above narcissism. Is personality disorder considered a, a mental illness? No, it's not a mental illness. It's a, a disorder. A mental illness is when you're is considered the way we use it is a mental illness is when the individual is out of touch with reality and really can't discern right from wrong. A mental health disorder like psychopathy, uh, the personality is flawed, but that individual knows right from wrong um, and chooses, um, you know, chooses not to follow the laws or chooses not to follow the rules. So it's a huge distinction but they get intertwined all the time. About your comments, your professional opinion or, or statistics about men versus women with a psychopathic disorder. Okay, so psychopathy is not limited to males or females. Most of the research has been done on male psychopaths up up to the last, I'd say, 10 years, but new research is being conducted all the time on um, that would involve females. So that distinction is very important. It's not limited to just um, uh, the male gender. Serial sexual killers are without question, mostly men, mostly um, males, which still kind of surprises me. Um, after all these years, but, uh, and I, I don't have an explanation for that as, as to why we don't see, um, we haven't seen women engage in that kind of criminal behavior, but we have not. And I've looked at it since the mid 1970s. So I suspect that I have no reason to think that that will change. How do, or how did you or other profilers, um, compartmentalize your work life versus your family life if you really love what you do it's not a it's not an issue whatsoever um you know even today it's it's those of us that you know that are retired but we still work in the field the work is so interesting and it's challenging and you're constantly thinking about what did i do right on that case what could i go back and redo on that case so I compare it in a very humble way. I compare it to people that say that work in a hospital, like the emergency room. I could never, ever in a million years do what those doctors and nurses and technicians do. And yet you talk to people that work in an emergency room and I say, how do you do that? And they say, I love it. I love it. And and so I see um, my kind of 
my interest in this work that I do kind of the same way. Um, and my off time, I spend thinking about it. In my work time, I spend thinking about it. I think you mentioned that that you never really felt frightened or afraid in the moment. Um, but were you ever threatened? Was your family ever threatened? Was I? Yes, I. I think I was threatened in during interviews, but um, my family was not threatened. But but I also because I was an FBI agent, I always had people with me. So even when I interviewed with um, Gary Ridgeway, the tactical team was right outside the door. And he knew the tactical team was, you know, right outside the door. And in other prisons, the correctional officer would be, you know, right outside the door if anything were to happen. It, there's no reason for me to take it, any unnecessary risk because I would always have the backup I needed. With the characteristics of these individuals being what they are, how is it possible to accurately test them being so devious, uh, wouldn't they intentionally try to either, you know, <laughs> raise the score, lower the score, answer the questions the way they think you want them answered? That's why the PCLR or the Psychopathy Checklist Revised was designed um, the world's ex by the world's expert, Dr. Robert Hare, um, because it's like a two-pronged test. You sit and you interview the individual themselves and get their background, just like an intake. Where were you born? How many siblings do you have? Who are your mom and dad? Just It's those kinds of questions that lead into questions about their life and how they handled things. But then the second prong is you go out and you verify their, their information by talking to family members and friends and people that, you know, that, that knew the individual. So you don't just accept... Um, the information that they give you. Uh, one of our guests um, stated that they had heard that at any given point in time, there are one to two serial killers active in the United States. Are there more within the growth of the population? Is that an accurate description of the numbers? We don't have we don't have numbers on serial killers. Uh, we never did. Um, there were estimates in the seventies and eighties when I first started that maybe there were twenty or thirty active serial murders at any one point in time. But those numbers were all um, conjectured. They were all made up. The reason that we don't know is um, because some victims have never been found. So we don't. If you don't have the victims, you can't um, determine that there was a serial killer responsible. Um, if the forensic evidence didn't exist, you couldn't tie cases together. I think that there are fewer cases today. Certainly, we do believe that fewer serial sexual murder cases today than there were in in the um, 70s, 80s and 90s. And it, my opinion on that is is because of the forensic evidence. Um, because we have DNA, we have FGG, or known as forensic genetic genealogy, which is what identified the Golden State Killer. So if someone were to go out today, let's say, and kill two or three people in in over a period of days, weeks, or months, the forensic evidence right now is so good, um, chances are they'd be caught pretty, pretty rapidly. But I, I will tell you, there are still very old cases that, that don't have the forensic evidence. Um, so based on their crime scenes, we think that they're related. Are they solvable like Zodiac? Maybe, but over the course of 50 years, forensic evidence gets thrown out, gets compromised. Um, so there are some many serial murder cases that will never be solved. You just can say, I think that Joe Blow did it, but I don't have any forensic evidence that tells me with any degree of certainty. But right now, that type of crime has diminished. And it started to diminish in the 90s. It's not at um, um, increased. The, I don't think it's increased since the 90s. What's taken place, what's replaced it, which we never saw coming. I don't care what anybody says. We did not see this one coming. Our mass murders. We did not see mass shootings coming. 
law enforcement is not that good at predicting what the new trends will be. We did not see Columbine coming, for example, and Columbine changed the for, uh, face of criminal behavior. Compared to sensation seeking, do you think that they truly did not realize they were killing someone in front of a window? Or is that more a reflection of uh, their belief that they're smarter than everyone else? I think it's a combination of things. So in that particular case, um, I, I looked at how the, mur the murders were also committed in broad daylight, um, in, in nice homes with a with homes on either side, the victims, we know the victims were um, yelling and trying to fight off the offender. So there were all these things that were taking place during the crime scene that most offenders would, would say, oh, I'm getting the heck out of here because somebody's going to hear me. Somebody is going to come knock, busting through that door. Somebody is going to call 911. But if, if your tolerance for risk in a crime scene is such that those kinds of things don't bother you. You just kind of keep on going. It's actually a concept that I, um, I've i labeled being a mission-oriented um, offender. And I think that some of these serial sexual um, killers are very mission-oriented. They decided that they were going to go into the environment and sexually assault or murder someone with that mission-oriented mindset. I don't care what gets in my way. I'm going to do it. So they may not be consciously aware of it, but they're, they're certainly not bothered by it. And most people would back away and say, I'll come back another day. With regard to the Zodiac killer, what do you think the best theory is as to why he stopped? Did he move? Did he die? Did he change his diet? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think in the case of Zodiac, he died. How often do serial killers leave a, a signature or a calling card? Um, my experience has been those are the minority of people we've, we've had. Um, well, it depends on what you're calling a calling card. Their calling card may have been unintentional. It may have been like their DNA could be kind of like a calling card. But if you're talking about like leaving a note or making a phone call to law enforcement or that sort of thing, um, something to taunt the police with, that doesn't happen all that often. Again, it's a very stupid thing to do because you're just creating more evidence for law enforcement. It does. It, it's not the majority of people that do that. I, am so, to interrupt. I was going to say, what makes a good profiler? Well, I can give you a few traits, but I, to me, one of the most important traits is um, to be a really good listener. Um, we would have people come into our offices that worked on these cases. These were very seasoned detectives and maybe they were looking at 10 homicides. And that probably would have been at least a week worth of meetings, eight to five all day to hear about each of the murders, right? 10 murders is a lot to talk about. And I would frequently sit there for five days, eight hours a day, take notes and say nothing. And some people are not particularly good listeners. They have to always be interrupting and asking questions. And for me, being a good profiler means take it all in. Just listen. Just be quiet. Uh, we have one question saying uh, we've got someone who would like to be in contact with you to arrange uh, another Zoom for their organization. Is that best that they contact you or contact someone through... LLI Nova. I need help with answering that one, guys. <laughs> I'll defer to Debbie. I do, either way, Debbie. Debbie has my information. Yeah, I can. Um, we um, we only have time for one more question. Um, so let me answer answer this. Um, I can provide uh, people with Mary Ellen's information. Um, my email is. In the chat box, wait, I can't type well. Mm -hmm. 
Last question is going to be, do profilers use, whoops, I just lost it. <laughs> I didn't memorize it fast enough. Uh, do profilers use the internet and or like things like the dark web in order to gain information? Um, if we needed to have that kind of investigative support, we had analysts in the behavioral analysis unit and I would just make a list and I'd say, hey, can you find out more information about this person? Um, you know, where they posted. Um, we often did things called like timelines. So maybe there was a suspect and there were murders in California and Florida and, and say uh, Massachusetts. And I'd say, I, I need a timeline. Was he ever in California and then later in Florida and then may, maybe in Massachusetts? So anything like that that required um, additional investigation, going through records and and online and that sort of stuff. We had analysts that would help us with that. Very good. I was trying to drop a survey in the uh, in the box. It is not working for me. So for those of you that joined us through AARP, um, you may get a survey in the uh, follow up email. And I will just say thank you so much, Mary Ellen. This was absolutely great. And I'll let uh, Debbie and Derek give their um, thanks as well. Turn it over back to you guys. I just uh, muted Derek by mistake. Oops, okay. I think yeah, I'm sorry. unmuted again. <laughs> yeah, no, so we only, we hardly have any time. I actually, um, I'm going to stop the recording now because we don't know how big the file is. But, All right. Well, just real, real quick, Debbie, I just wanted to thank uh, Mary Ellen for a wonderful uh, program. We had 284 people uh, that I saw, and many of them stayed on till you know even beyond you know the the time. So. That speaks to a very good program. Thank you, Trudy, very much. And all the uh, viewers from AARP, Debbie, thank you very much. And once again, I'll just say that uh, LLI's website is LLINova.org. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, please uh, reach out to LLI if you're if you're interested. Uh, I, we are the best deal in town. Debbie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, and we, um, I'm going to stop the recording, but we will have a recording for AARP and for us. Thank you, everybody. A real pleasure. Bye. Bye-bye.